Welcome everyone, Parsha de Shavua. This week we're learning Parsha Mishpatim, brought to you by Be There Israel and Or Chadash. You can see it live or archived on both of these sites. Start with a nigun, like we usually do. This week we're going to be learning Parshat Mishpatim. And for those who have Orchard of Delights, and you hear the Shior, and then look in the Parsha, you'll see that a lot of the information is going to be in the book. But like last week, we're going to put it together in a completely different way. So what we're going to do is, as we do uh, in most of the shirin, we learn it according to Pardes, Pshat, Remez, Jush, and Sod, the simple, literal text, the alluded to, 
hints in the text, the allegory, parable, metaphor, and then the secret, mystical, Kabbalistic understanding. So we'll start with the first verse of the, of the Parsha. Ve'ela mishpatim asher tasim lifnehem. And these are the judgments that you shall put before them. So we're actually going to bring a number of different simple, direct, literal understandings of this verse. But we'll start with the first letter of the Parsha. V. Which means and. So you'd say, well, what can you learn from the word and? And these are the judgments that you shall put before them. But that's the first thing that Rashi addresses. Why doesn't the Parsha start? These are the judgments that you shall put before them. What's the and doing here? It's not so obvious. The, the Torah doesn't waste a letter. So if there's an and, there must be a reason for it. So Rashi says a very, very uh, important thing. The first thing he says, Kol makom shinemar ela, pasel at the The ela mosif al So The first thing he says is every place where it says these without an and, it means it's making like a clear break from what came before it. So the Torah is introducing a new matter here. Ela, these are the judgments. But then he says, but if it says the Ela, Mosif al it is a continuation of what happened before. Now, since this is the beginning of the Parsha, what he means to say is that there is a juxtaposition between what happens at the end of last Parsha and the beginning of this Parsha. And that's why he says, and. So how does he explain that? He says, Mahari Shoni Nisinai, just like the previous Parsha of Yitro was the giving of the Torah at Sinai, Af Elam Sinai. These are also from Sinai. Then he continues as, as like a, a different understanding of the and. And he says, V'lama nismacha parshad dinin l'parshad nizbeach. Now he's being even more specific. Why does the Torah connect? He calls it parshad dinin, the the Parsha of Judgments, a little bit different word than Mishpatim, but it means basically the same thing. The last thing in, in the Parsha before was if you build an altar. Mm -hmm. So he wants to know what's the connection. It says, from this we learn that you have to put the Sanhedrin, the high court, next to the place of the Mizbeah, which was the temple. This is where we learn that the Sanhedrin sat in the temple complex. This is where we learn it from. So all of a sudden, it's not such a simple vav here. So much so that they learn where the, the Sanhedrin has to sit. Now it has a deeper meaning of, of why judgment has to happen in the same place as the temple. But Rashi is, is just is more like where does it have to be situated, but obviously it's even deeper. That you can't separate the what we'll call civil and criminal law from ritual law. That's what it's saying, a little bit deeper than the pshat. A little bit deeper is what it's saying is, really based on the first thing that Rashi says, just like the Ten Commandments were given at Sinai, 
so are these judgments given at Sinai. It's one integral whole. The Torah does not differentiate between the what we'll call the ritualistic laws or laws of belief or laws of practice and civil and criminal. It's all one body of law. So that's how Rashi starts. We're going to come back later and see a much deeper understanding of what this Vav is doing here. But now, still on the, the Pshat, is that uh, it's very, very important to point out that this Parsha has the second largest amount of mitzvot of any Parsha in the Torah. There's only one Parsha that has more mitzvot, and that's in, in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, Parsha Ki Tetzay. So, obviously this is a very important Parsha. In other words, between this Parsha and Ki Tetzay is a full 25% of all of the mitzvot of the Torah come in two Parshas. Come in two Parshas. And it's, it's very customary in many, many yeshiva seminaries to learn either and or Parsha Mishpatim for the whole year or Parsha Ki Tetzay. Because they're like, like I said, you can go through a quarter of all the mitzvot in two Parshas. But the point that I want to make is that, still on the simple, literal understanding here, that this parsha, is in, its importance is more than just the amount of mitzvot it has. It's in the influence that this parsha has had, not only on Jewish thought and practice, but on world thought and practice. That this parsha, which has the full gamut of types of mitzvot, but it's weighed very much towards criminal and civil law, becomes the basis of all law in the world. As we say often, the Judeo-Christian heritage. And anyone who's read the Quran or knows anything about Islam knows how much influence the Torah has on the, on the Quran and the inception of Islam. And anyone who knows world history also knows the uh, effect of, of these ideas and how they're implemented in, in actual law and the way it's influenced law and the concept of judgment in every society in the world. So I just want to mention that because uh, it's, it's very, very important to understand. As we go through this, they seem like uh, isolated mitzvot. But when you put them all together, they create the foundation of all law, all legal systems. So that's still with the shot. Now, on the end of this verse, uh, one of the most important Rashis in the entire Torah is on the words, you shall put before them. Remember, the whole verse is translated, and these are the judgments that you shall put before them. So this Rashi is of absolute critical importance for, for understanding the Torah and especially for Jewish education. So look what Rashi says. He says like this, God said to Moshe, 
Lomar, don't, don't let it rise in your mind to think the following. I was God is saying, don't think the following. Don't think that I will teach them the, the law two or three times until it, basically what it means is until it, they memorize it. They memorize the law. And I don't need to trouble myself to explain to them the deeper meanings and the expanded explanation of these matters. So all of that was God saying, don't think that. Lachain Namar, so therefore the verse says, Asher Tasim Lifnehem, that you shall put before them. What does this mean? Kishokhan Aruch Umuchan Lecho Lifnehadam, like a set table ready for a person to eat, which is like an idiom. What it means is, no, Moshe, it's not enough to get them to memorize the law. You do have to trouble yourself to teach them the concepts behind it, the deeper meanings, the reasons for these mitzvot. And you have to set it before them in a way that will be like a feast, ready to eat. So this is such an incredibly important Rashi because we have lost a couple of generations of Jews because all that was explained to people is do this and do that and don't do this and don't do that and no explanation of why. In fact, the last few generations people were, were barely even taught what to do and what not to do to be honest. <clears throat> but even when they were taught, they were not taught the reasons behind it. So this is such an important understanding of, of how Jewish education needs to be set up. It's not enough to learn the pshat. It's just not enough. God himself says to Moshe, it's not enough. You have to teach them the deeper meanings. Now, the word here used for deeper meanings, ta'amei hadavar. Tam literally means taste. The taste of the matter. That people, that, in other words, it's so tangible that people can taste it. But more than that, we're told that when Mashiach comes, he will teach us all ta'amei mitzvot the deeper reasons for the mitzvah. So you can understand why I think this is such, like, one of the most important Rashi's, because from God, as it were, from God's own mouth, he's teaching Moshe how to teach. And if God says it's not enough just to teach the simple, literal translation until they memorize it, well, we better get the message before we learn, lose another generation. So that already is a, a remez. That's like a hint in the words themselves that these teachings are much deeper than we imagine. And let's see how deep. So if we go ahead to Pasuk, you'd bet. And if the Rashi that I just gave over 
It is one of the most important Rashi's in the entire Chumash. The Rashi we're about to learn is one of the most amazing Rashi's in the entire Chumash. So what does the text say? Make ishu mimet mot If someone kills uh, with premeditation, then he shall die. The death penalty. Though um, the expression in the Gomorrah is that if, if, if the Sanhedrin actually sentenced someone to death once every 70 years, they were called a hanging court. So in other words, there's a whole series of they shall certainly die. But we should just know that it virtually never happened. That's a, a teaching in and of itself. But then what it says is the following. But what about a case if someone inadvertently kills someone? He did, it literally means that someone did not hunt him. He didn't, like, plan it. And God put it into his hand that this person should die through his, his hand. I will place for you a, 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 a locality that you can run and seek haven in. So it's, there's a lot said in this one verse here. What is this? I will give you a place that you can run to. This is talking about what's called Are Miklat, cities of refuge. At the time of the Torah, there were no jails. So if someone killed purposely and there were witnesses, then they were, they were killed. But if someone killed not on purpose, but there was some culpability. In other words, there was, they, they certainly didn't do it on purpose, but they're not like totally, you know, um, like guilt-free. So they would have to go to what's called the city of refuge, and they would have to stay there. It was as if that was their jail. It, it was like house arrest. The whole city is open to them, but they can't leave the city. Okay, so if you notice my translation, there's, there's something very mysterious here. It says, and he did not plan it, and God put it into his hand. So the obvious question is, what does that mean? Because it sounds like that God caused this to happen. God used this person, as it were, to administer some kind of a judgment. So Rashi has to comment here. But his, not only his introduction, but his further explanation is just absolutely amazing. And here we're going to call this, as you'll see in a second, this is a drusha on Mishpatim. This is a, like, as you'll see, a parable and an allegory of how our judgments executed in this world. How, how do judgments come to be? So look what Rashi says. And the words, and God put it into his hand. So he says, Zimen liyado. God orchestrates it to happen by his hand. Now listen to this. Lashon lo tu'unet. Oh, excuse me. I'm, I'm jumping to the sec his second explanation here. Yeah? 
He has two explanations that we got put it in his hands. So the first one, he says, he, he creates the situation where this thing will come to pass. So now he explains like this. The Lama Tate says, Zot Milfanav, why does this come out from before him, in other words, before God? Hushamar David, this is what David said. Kasher Yomar Mashal Akadmoni Mirashayim Yetse Rasha. So he says, this is what David was talking about when he said that the following is said in the ancient parable. What does it say in this ancient parable? That from evil ones come evil. So Rashi says, and what is this ancient parable? What 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 is David talking about? He says, Umashal Akadmoni, Huha Torah. This ancient parable is the Torah itself. Shehi Mashal HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Because the Torah is the parable of God. Can you, can, can you imagine how deep <laughs> what Rashi is saying here? Shehu Kad Muno Shel Olam. And why is God called the ancient parable? Because he precedes everyone. He is, when it says ancient, it means there's nothing that precedes him. So that in itself is just, it's, it's such a, a deep thing that Rashi is saying here. Because when we talk about learning the Torah according to Pshat, Remez, Drush, and Sod, so this is maybe the clearest <laughs> Rashi in the entire Torah, which is saying that, in essence, and, and please, no one misunderstand me, because the Torah is also a historical uh, account. But here Rashi is calling the Torah the, an the, the, the parable of the ancient one. The Torah is a parable. And it's God's parable. And it's a parable that there's nothing that precedes it. So this, we can meditate on for the next, you know, next hundred years, <laughs> each in their own way. But this is just such an amazing understanding of the whole concept of drush, of the Torah as being an allegory, a parable. But again, so I'm not misunderstood, we don't divide between the literal meaning, the alluded to meaning, the allegorical meaning, and the mystical meaning. They all work together. And that's exactly what God said to Moshe. Don't think it's enough just to teach the Peshat. Because you can't understand the Peshat if you don't understand the Remez, the Drush, and the Sod. They all go together. And you can't understand the Sod, the mystical meaning, if you don't understand the Peshat. You won't understand the mystical meaning if you don't understand the Peshat. It's an integral unity. So now, Rashi continues, though. Because remember... Rashi left us with the question, how does David know that evil things come out from evil people? So then he brings this incredible mushal. And I won't read it, but I'll just, I'll just give it over. So he says like this, there are two people. One person killed another person on purpose. And there were no witnesses. 
So nothing happened to him. A second person killed someone by accident. Again, there are no witnesses. And nothing happens to him. So Rashi says, remember in the beginning he says, Zimen liyado. He orchestrates it that it will happen in his hand. So then Rashi says, God, Zimen is like invite. Like we'll, we'll, before we bench, we make a mazuman. As we invite everyone to bless together. Call them the Zuman. Because we're inviting. So Rashi says, God invites these two people to a hotel. Invite meaning he causes it to happen. That these two people will come to a hotel. The one who kills on purpose is sitting under a tree. The one who killed inadvertently sees that there is actually a ladder going up the tree and this, this person sitting under the ladder. So he goes up the tree, doesn't explain why, picks some fruit, who knows. He climbs up the ladder and he falls down on top of the person who's sitting in the chair and kills him. But this time there are witnesses. So the person who killed on purpose the first time has just been killed. And the, per the person who killed inadvertently actually killed inadvertently another time. But this time there are witnesses. And because you know, it wasn't totally responsible for him to be climbing a ladder when someone's sitting under it. This time he has to go to a city of refuge. So God explains, this is how judgment happens in the world. Now obviously it's a mashal, it's a parable. But the parable is uh, true. This is what's called Mida Kenega Mida, a measure for a measure. That's how judgment is dispensed in this world, according to principles, spiritual principles. Mida Kenega Mida. What goes around comes around. In the East, it's called karma. We call it Mida Kenega Mida measure against a measure. So this is understanding judgments on the level of drasha. Okay, now we're going to go to two explanations. And we're going to touch on the, the more mystical understanding of Mishpati. Okay, so we'll start with this. If you remember, we began the class with and these are the judgments that you shall put before them. And we learned uh, two very important Rashis of why it starts with ve'ela. The Zohar Kodesh, on the opening words, says the following. And these are the judgments that you shall put before them. So the Zohar says... Rabbi, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says to his, his students, he says, the time has now come to reveal a mystery. And he says, and these are the judgments that you should put before them. These are the secrets of reincarnation. And then the Zohar goes into 
a long explanation of the of some of the mechanics of reincarnation. And the understanding is that the whole parsha is the secret of reincarnation. <clears throat> so there's a famous story of the Baal Shem Tov. That a man comes to the Baal Shem Tov and he's very upset. And, 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 and the person who's coming is, is a God-fearing um, person. And straight, honest. Comes to the Baal Shem and he says, you know, I was just in uh, before the baked in today. Uh, I and my, my partner had, had a disagreement and we could not solve it, so we went to the baked in. And I'm, I'm really upset because I, I lost the judgment. And he said, I'm not upset that I lost. But what I'm upset with is I know absolutely that this was not a correct judgment. I know that this is not right. And I'm just so upset. So the Baal Shem said to him, he said, on the level of truth, you're 100% correct. It's called emet. He said, but there's also a concept called emet la'amito, meaning the truth of truths. And the Baal Shem revealed to him that in a previous lifetime he had wronged his partner. And he ended up with money that he shouldn't have had. So he said, according to the truth, in, in what you can see in front of you, you're correct, this was, this, this was not a right judgment. But on the level of the truth of truths, justice was just served. Justice was just served. So this is just a story of what, what Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is, is hinting to here. Now we should know that the teachings of reincarnation do not appear in the Chumash. They do not appear in the, in the Tanakh. They do not appear in the Mishnah, the Gemara, the Midrash. There are hints to it, though. But nothing explicit, nothing direct. It's not discussed. It's, it's completely like not on the radar until the Zohar. The Zohar and, and a, another Kabbalistic book from the same, the traditions from the same time, the Bahir, were the first to speak openly about reincarnation. And that's what, what Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says. The time has now come to reveal a mystery. So when you go through the Parsha, there's a lot of judgments here. People, you know, people are getting killed. People are getting injured. People are, you know, falling in in, in uh, pits that other people make. People's oxen are goring other people's oxen. People are stealing. People are stealing um, money, animals. I mean, there's just um, uh, people are not teach, uh, treating their workers correctly. All these different things are happening. And so what we're being told is, if we go back to the story that, that Rashi told, you certainly can learn the story without the idea of reincarnation. You know, this Mita Kinegad Mita happens in this world, in this lifetime. 
And I'm sure we've all experienced that sometimes the Mita Kanegan Mita comes immediately. Comes immediately. You do something, you say something, you think something, and one minute later, you see it as clear as day, it comes right back at you. Other times, it can be a week, a month, a year. It can be 50 years later. Or it could be five lifetimes later. So what Rashi said, you certainly, you, it doesn't have to apply to reincarnation, but it just happens that it's explaining the same mechanism, the same dynamics in which reincarnation works. So now we're going to introduce another idea that's, that's very, very important. Because, again, when you read the Parsha, everything seems very black and white and very, I don't know if harsh is the right word, but very uh, stark. It's like, like cutting through. And yet, in... In Jewish tradition, mishpat is motivated by compassion. But again, if you look, if you look at the parsha and you look at the pshat, hard to see that. But we see it in actuality because throughout the parsha, it's mot yumat. This person sh shall die, and this person shall die for this infraction and that infraction. But we already said that it's, it's in the Talmud that says they, they were hardly ever um, administered. So you say, well, so what are they doing here? So we have the idea of a, a, um, a deterrent on a simple level as a deterrent. And as a deeper level, just teaching the person the, the, the responsibility and the, and, the, and the energy they take on by doing certain acts. So in the Shemona Esrei, we have a whole blessing that we pray that we should have good judges and good leaders. And the bracha ends, Baruch Atah Hashem, Melech Ohed Tzedakah Umishpat. God who loves charity and law, judgment. And they're put together for a reason. Because mishpat without tzedakah is not called mishpat. So there's a very, very important discussion, debate in the Gemara as to what is the purpose of, of courts of law. Is it to come to the truth or to come to compromise? Very, very important discussion. Because it's, it's discussing well, what the Torah makes clear that how important a, a society based on law is. In fact, one of the seven myths of the Noach, one of the, the seven universal laws is also to make courts of justice. That is one of the, the mitzvot. So it's not just on Jews, it's on all humanity. But the Gemara wants to know, but well, what? But what is the purpose? So, the discussion is that when it can be accomplished, compromise comes before strict judgment and based on truth. And now we're going to try and understand why. So this is, a, this is a Torah from Rav Ginsburg. It's like a, it's an incredibly deep understanding of 
not just justice, but reality. And he says like this, to understand this, we have to understand the concept of symptom, of contraction. The, the cosmology is given over by the Ari, and we've discussed this many times, but we're going to see how it applies here, is that before God created the world, there was, there was nothing but the infinite oneness and light of God. But in order to make a finite world that would have the appearance of being independent, so God had to, as it were, contract his infinite being in order to create what's called a vacuum. And into that vacuum, then God shines a ray of light. And from that ray of light, all the worlds are created. But they are finite. And they also have the appearance of being independent. So this is the famous uh, concept of symptom. But within Kabbalah, there is a, a, a major disagreement as to how to understand the contraction. And it's called Kipshuto o Kisheeno Pshuto. Do we understand the contraction as Pshat, Kipshuto, as literal? or figurative. In other words, did God truly contract and leave a space with no divine <laughs> presence? <laughs> or is it not like the pshat? And even in the vacuum, what is a vacuum? A vacuum means that there's nothing else there. But even in the vacuum, there is a what's called Rishimu, an impression of God's infinite presence before he contracted. So one might ask, what does this have to do with anything we're talking about? So Rav Ginsburg explains like this, that a type of world view that's based on the idea that the Tzimtzum was literal, he says that what it causes is a binary, dualistic way of seeing the world. Why? Because there is a place where there is the presence of God, and there is a place where there is not the presence of God as it were. And what this leads to is a way of looking at the world where one sees the world as in opposites. So when it gets down to judgment, and we all are involved in judgment literally on a daily, hourly basis. We're constantly judging situations. We'll call it evaluating. Mm -hmm. We have to make decisions on the spot, and, and that's called judgment. Like, do we or don't we? Should we or shouldn't we? Should I wait or should I go? Should I apply? Should I not apply? Should I go to this class or should I go to that class? Should I stay home sick today? Should I not stay home sick? Whatever it is, we're just constantly, hour by hour, making decisions, and we have to make judgments. So when it gets, though, to a court of law, if we see the world in, in colors of opposites, then we'll look at a situation and we'll say, this person is right, and this person is wrong. 
And not just in a court of law. Again, when we go through our daily um, lives, we're going to judge either very black and white. This is good and this is bad. This person is right. This person is wrong. I'm right. Everyone else is wrong. Whatever it is. But if we see the world that the tzimtzum was not kapshuto, then that leaves a place for what's called paradox and compromise. Because then we look at the world and even if even if we think that we're right and someone else is wrong, we have a broad enough consciousness to, to also understand maybe they also a little bit right. Maybe it's not so like you know black and white. And when we see situations, we're able to see there's two sides of the story here. So Rabbi Ginsburg explains that this is two ways of seeing mishpatim. From our own personal lives or all the way to the, to the, to the courtroom. Now, do we see the world like very dualistically? Like, which he calls Eitzadat Tov Barah. He said that was one of the um, of the negative results of eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil is we started to experience the world as the good guys and the bad guys. And the eight Sahayim, it's not this and that. It's it's unified. It could be paradoxical, but it's unified. So this is just a deep understanding. So that's what, what it says, Melech Ohev, Tzedakah Umishpat. God who loves charity and justice. Now if you look at that bracha from a binary consciousness, then you'll say, oh, there's charity and there's justice. But if you look at it from a more unified uh, consciousness, then you'll see, no, charity and justice have to go together. Now that's not to say that you can compromise on everything. That's not what it's saying. But it's saying that when you have the, the choice in the, in the, in a judge in the Jewish court, it's more important to make peace between people than to say, you're right and you're wrong. That's it. End of case. It's better that each side is able to see that there's some right and some wrong on both sides. And it could be that this person is a little bit more right than that person. And there, there will be, let's say, a monetary penalty or this or that. But there's two ways that a person can leave the court. You leave the court like the, the person in the, in the Baal Shem Tov story. Saying like, they ruled wrong. Or they both could leave, and one really won and one really lost, but they both leave feeling that they won because they feel they were listened to, they were heard, the, just, the judges understood, they took into consideration, and even though I technically lost, but I won because justice was done. This is a very, very important understanding of how the Jewish legal system is supposed to work doesn't mean it always does work that way, but it certainly is supposed to, supposed to work like that.
So let's go back and look at this Vav again one more time. Ve'ela mishpatim asher tasim lifneha. And these are the judgments that you shall put before them. So if what is being alluded to here is the secrets of reincarnation, so then when it says the Eila, what it's saying is sometimes judgments are Eila, meaning they, they posel at the Rishonim, they divide before what came before. It's a new matter here. But if it says the Eila, it means it's connected to something that happened before. And in this case, what it's alluding to, another lifetime. So sometimes the, the judgments that we go through in this world have less to do with this world than evening up a prior score. So that's a deeper understanding of the Eila. And these are the judgments. So I end with a bracha. It'll be a long bracha because we have to put together everything that we learned tonight. So the first part of the bracha is that we are never satisfied with just learning the simple, literal text. We always have to have the awareness that I, I need the pshat. I can't understand the other levels without the simple understanding, the literal understanding. But in God's own words, don't, you can't, can't be satisfied with that. Always have to understand that there are deeper and deeper levels of understanding. And then also that we're able to see the, the divine mashal, divine parable that the Torah is. And to understand there's nothing in the Torah that's not a parable. Once again, this is not taking away from the literal historical account. But it's just like in our own lives, Sometimes we, we go through a certain event or incident and we understand it one way. Five years later, we might understand it completely different because we've changed and we have new insight and a new perspective. And all of a sudden, we start to see there's something so much deeper about what happened over there. I just didn't even notice the first time around. So that's the Torah also. And this, this, this Rashi that we learned, where the Torah is the primordial, ancient parable of God, who is the most ancient of all. And the last part of the bracha is that we should, we should learn to see the contraction not in its literal sense, but in the more figurative sense, which then gives us the ability to see the world through the eyes of the, the, the tree of life and not the tree of knowledge of good and evil.